Elsie, lovely to have you with us this evening. Nice to be here. So, um, Chelsea Geddes is a prostitution survivor with 20 years experience in the fully decriminalised sex trade in New Zealand. She managed to escape after a prolonged struggle about a year ago. She is a passionate writer and long-term activist against the sex trade. So Chelsea, I know that you want to talk about the New Zealand model, but I just I listened to you at the conference and I was very touched by how you got involved in prostitution. Mm -hmm. And I just think it's helpful to give a little bit of your um, that, that information to our listeners because this whole thing about um, prostitution is a choice. I just want them to hear a little bit about the choices that you had that, that drew you in. Oh, all right, so um, when I was 14 and um, cl close to 15, I was um, kicked out of home. So um, my home life was quite violent. Um, but the thing that got me kicked out was um, I'd started sneaking out to see my friends, which I, I wasn't allowed to leave the house only for school or church. So, um, yeah, they took they accused me of all sorts of things, took me to um, the hospital and demanded they perform a virginity test on me, which the hospital um, refused. And um, so I just got beaten up and kicked out with a, a letter of trespassing for two years, which I didn't know was not legitimate as I was only 14 years old because you know it looked official and I believed it was real so yeah and I um, moved in with a pedophile man because who else takes in 14 year old girls um yeah yeah and then things just snowballed from there really didn't they yeah okay so um uh, <clears throat> the fully decriminalised system that was adopted in New Zealand in 2003 is held up by many people in the UK as the best system. Could you give us a brief introduction as to what it involves? So um, the full decriminalisation model, it decriminalises um, people bought in prostitution, but it also decriminalizes the buyers and pimps and any kind of profiteering. Um, it isn't a, a very regulated system like legalization might be. It's more sort of a turn the other way um, um, system. I mean, it's very easy to get a brothel license. You just fill out um, a brief form and um, as simple as that really. Okay, so, uh... One of the claims about the New Zealand model that we often hear is that it recognises sex workers, and I do my little uh, inverted commas, as workers, which means they're covered by employment law, have the same rights and protections as workers in other industries. What would you say to that? How does this work out in practice? Um, so what, what this actually means is that prostituted women um, gain, gain another pimp. The IRD, um, Inland Revenue Department, they want to take a cut of the profit that pimps make in selling people for sexual use. So um, in brothels, we aren't covered by um, employment law because we fall sort of awkwardly between definitions of employees and of um, independent contractors. So it's disputed whose responsibility it is to pay the taxes and levies and all that, whether that's the job of the pimps or the, the prostitutes. So um, because of that, there isn't access to um, any of those protections of regular employment, like sick leave or the minimum wage or maternity leave, accident and emergency compensation, pensions, protection from harassment, all of that, there's um, none of that. Yeah, when you and I were chatting before, I was saying it's a bit like the sort of people sometimes in the sales industry here who that um, supposedly self-employed, but they can't go and work for other people. And we were saying they don't have the same freedoms, um, but they the employers don't take any responsibility for the things they're not covered in law for, as you say, yeah. pensions and sick pay yes. and all of that. So in the um, in the NZPC sort of handbook, there's a little sort of 
checklist and chart that you can you can do to work out you know whether you would be an independent contractor or an employee and and I did it and it came out that I am an employee so it, it's that I'm an employee being denied all my employee rights um I, I I mean in this situation you'd have to really take it to court you know to have any sort of resolution and um I, I don't know many prostituted women who want to take on some big millionaire pimp in a, in a court um yeah I, I never did that I don't know anyone who ever has no I'm not surprised um so we we often hear that the New Zealand model is the best legal approach to protect the safety rights and health of people who sell sex do you agree with this claim um you know not not even slightly not at all um, so there's no there's no safety in prostitution and especially not when buyers and pimps are decriminalized um, so you can't make complaints because the police will do nothing about anything um, prostitution it, it involves the sale of human rights which are supposed to be inalienable so um, I mean the right to not enjoy endure torture, or sexual harassment, abuse, violence, and rape, the right to free expression, to fair and favorable work conditions. Um, all of these are missing for prostituted people. And there's no deterrent to any abusive practices and treatment of prostitutes, prostitute people here because there's no law enforcement against any of the actors. Police don't go after anyone for involvement in prostitution whatsoever. Yeah, we, we were talking, weren't we, yesterday, how there's a sort of different level of, you, you know, implementation of the law where if you are assaulted or insulted at work and you're in a shop or if you're on the street um, walking and somebody attacks you, then that's, uh, you go to the police, then somebody uh, says this is, this is against the law. But if you happen to be working, in a brothel, then the police say, yeah. well, that's part of the job. So so when, when I've gone to the police, they've, they've just turned me away. So um, one example that I used in my speech was um, I got um, concussed and, and mugged by a large man who was picking on another girl and I stood up for her. So I got knocked out. And um, after that, I went around the corner to the police station and they, they just, you know, they turned me away. They actually told me just to look in the public rubbish bins for my purse. And that was the only, and, and you know, the only thing they said. Uh-huh, it, it just, I, I just found that totally scandalous that you don't implement the law if it happens inside a brothel. Um, so, and also following on from that, um, it's often said that full decriminalization makes it easier to negotiate condom use and to turn down unpleasant clients or specific practices. So it's not feeling likely, but you can enlighten me. <laughs> I mean, I, I was actually really shocked when I read this question because um, oh, how does decriminalizing make it easier to enforce any boundaries? So it's, a, it's actually um, impossible. Um, if buyers were criminalized, I'd be able to call the police on them if they cross my boundaries, which um, so the threat of that would act as a deterrent for their sort of worser behaviors. But um, under decriminalization, there's absolutely nothing I could do, you know, that men are larger and stronger than me, and I'd have to fight them off, basically. Um, so it's against the law to not wear a condom in prostitution. I think there's up to a $2,000 fine. But um, that penalty is applied equally to the sex buyers and the prostituted person as if it was, um, you know, an equal a decision to be made. Whereas we know that it's the buyers who press for this and, you know, force it on the women or coerce them with, with more money when they're in a desperate situation. And so, I mean, you're not going to call up the police and give yourself a $2,000 fine for not wearing a condom, you know. You're just going to deal with it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. absolutely just you wouldn't, would you? No, not at all. Um, apparently, it's written into the law that sex workers have the right to refuse any client for any reason at any point. How does this work in practice? So firstly, this only works if you don't need the money. 
most women in prostitution in New Zealand do need the money from every client they get because the pay is so low. So there's that sort of pressure to not say no. Um, for those in a position to be a bit choosy, like they're, they're making enough money or, you know, whatever, um, that doesn't work in a brothel um, prostitution because the management forced you into bookings um, you don't want to do. Um, they often just arrange bookings without even telling you, let alone asking you. So um, it, it would only be if you were working on your own and in a position of earning enough money to be able to say no that you might then be able to turn buyers down for, you know, whatever they say, but you'd also have to deal with the reaction of these men to being told no, which um, men who buy women, they don't take no for an answer. So that could be a very ugly situation to deal with on your own. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I know that you had great difficulty exiting the sex industry. Is there anything about the New Zealand system that made this particularly hard? Yeah, so it's because there's no organizations or services to help women exit prostitution under decriminalization. And when it's viewed as um, legitimate work, it's not treated as anything people need help um, to leave. The cultural attitude that prostitution should be, you know, empowering to the women in it can also blame women for being disempowered as some kind of failure at their job or even, you know, as mentally ill um, when they acknowledge that it's not empowering. Um, there's no public or private money to exit services whatsoever in New Zealand. So women are mostly trapped. Yeah, yeah I think you were saying yesterday as well, um, the, the whole thing about decriminalizing uh, sex work and prostitution is that it's a job like any other so why would you need services to exit it and it's it wouldn't it doesn't sort of make any sense so what the thing of decriminalization it's negating the fact that it's something that you need help to leave which is um yeah. further disempowering um uh, People here claim that you can't be deprived of social security benefits in New Zealand for refusing to work or continue to work in a brothel. So again, what was your experience of this, given that you found it so difficult to exit prostitution? How did that work out in practice? Um, so, well, anyone can get um, a job seeker benefit in, in New Zealand. You just have to prove that you're actively looking for work. So, I mean, I've been on job seeker benefit at times through, throughout my life as well. Um, but it's, it's half of the minimum wage, which is already lower than the calculated living wage. Um, it's not something anyone can live on long term without the underlying causes of their joblessness um, being addressed. So we really need a welfare program that supports people um, to move up into a better position rather than just leave them to stagnate in quite an unlivable position where, you know, many will turn to crime, like selling drugs or, you know, to get the process, um, to get the money they need or, or to prostitution. Um, because the, the root issues, why they don't have a job, why they didn't finish school or whatever was going on, um, they're just ignored and they're just left on benefit, you know, on the benefit. Yeah. Um, another uh, justification for the New Zealand model is that it outlaws sex trafficking. Uh, this is also true in Germany, but it's incredibly hard to prove in a court of law. And so in practice, there are very few con uh, convictions compared to the estimated number of victims. How does New Zealand do in comparison to Germany? Um, so I don't think we do any better. Um, no one ever asks anyone in prostitution if they're, if they're by choice. Um, they just tell us that we are. Um, you know, I don't think there's any investigation into prostitution in New Zealand because it's been decriminalized. So uh, officials can just sort of wash their hands of it. Um, obviously, Germany will have more instances of trafficking women from overseas, um, simply because it's a larger country with um, land borders with other nations. While well, New Zealand is just a small island um, at the bottom of the world, completely isolated. And so New Zealand mostly traffics its own citizens into prostitution. And, um, you know, a, a lot of the women who 
who are being trafficked, they, they don't know that that's what's happening to them because it's treated like a normal job and they're told it's a normal job. Like I myself didn't realize that I actually would fit the definition or, or criteria under the Palermo protocol of a victim of trafficking because I was told all my life that this is you know, my fault and my choice and it's a job. And so I had no idea that I, I was trafficked. So, I mean, nobody, nobody looks into that at all. Right. Thank you so much. Um, we know that Amnesty, the World Health Organization, the Royal College of Nursing and numerous other trade unions all have formal policies of support for full decriminalization as implemented in New Zealand. What would you like to say to them? Um, I think that they should have listened to um, the survivor and radical feminist organizations that really tried to, to, to speak with them. And I'm speaking about um, Amnesty International um, instead of implementing their policy, which was drafted by a pimp, um, Douglas Fox. I think that was a really um, low move. And I think, um, you know, he got to speak about that because he is a so-called sex worker as a, as a brothel owner, because this term just encompasses everything and muddies the water. So I, I think there needs to be an investigation into Amnesty International regarding um, corruption. And I, I'm not familiar with the, the other organizations, but I think that I believe that they take their lead from Amnesty International. So, yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go to questions? Um, I think just that there's this sort of an and there's an idea that um, what happens to prostituted women like you can sort of have a, a group of people split off from the rest of society and you can sort of treat them however you want and it, it won't come back and affect um, the rest of the people like so men will come and buy women in prostitution or you know in porn and stuff for acts that they know that their girlfriends and wives wouldn't um, put up with and people seem to think it's fine for this sort of um, section of society to to take on that abuse and I've, I've even seen like officials and newspapers or stuff like recommend that maybe um, criminal sex offenders or something should be given prostitutes or something to stop them from you know committing crime against the public and I think that um, you know there's this there's really no way to just treat a class of people like that and not to come back and affect you so these um, acts of degradation, everything there in the pornography that people watch, the men who've gone see us go back and interact with other other people. And so it, it does become that their wives and girlfriends get pressured, um, you know, into these sorts of things too, um, through the porn use and all of that. And, um, you know, I think it really affects every woman. And if it doesn't affect a woman specifically, then it will affect her daughters, you know. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in that culture that's all I, I would like to add yeah oh well that was absolutely you know horrifying to be honest but thank you so much for illuminating uh it, you know um the so-called wonderful New Zealand model um perhaps we could uh open up to I've got Diane Martin with her hand up Diane do you, do you want to ask Chelsea a question? Yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll put my video on. <laughs> I'm lying on the sofa. Um, Chelsea, thank you so much. It's so important for us to hear um, from the people most affected by, you know, how horrific oppression and violence at prostitution is, especially as all we ever hear is, the New Zealand model, you know, touted as being progressive. And so it's it's your voice and voices of other yeah. survivors that is so key um, for us to dismantle it and to have specific information. Um, you've said a lot, um, I've made loads of notes and you've said a lot that, that we can kind of add it to our arsenal of myth busting. Um, I think for me as someone who founded um, and ran for many, many years an exiting service for women involved in street prostitution in London. I'm really passionate about exiting and um, it's just so frustrating to think that uh, there, there isn't the, that wasn't the help available that you um, absolutely should have had. 
So it might be a while before hopefully we can get the laws changed back. Let's have high goals. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, in terms of exiting, how um, how do you think uh, this can be kind of taken forward in the meantime? I mean, I'm wondering, I'm assuming, I mean, I've met some great New Zealand feminists that have worked in the domestic violence and sexual violence arena. Are, do you think there are ways of kind of linking up um, organisations that are very women-centred that would have a feminist analysis of prostitution? Um, um, is there ways of kind of, I suppose, pe in, in the meantime, because you haven't got the specific specialist exiting services, what do you think could contribute to, to that for women? I don't know how that could really work um, in New Zealand because all of the women's organizations, they, they follow the, the legal position and our, our country's position on it, that it's, it's not part of violence against women, you know. So I've met people from Women's Refuge who actually really agree with me about prostitution, but it's not in their materials. They're not officially able to view things this way. Like this would be their just personal opinion that they keep to themselves because New Zealand considers it, uh, um, you know, a normal industry. So they expected to kind of toe the party line. And is that because also yeah. they, their funding would be attached to that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's horrific. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. I've got um, a couple of comments in the chat line. Um, perhaps I'll re read them out. So um, Anne Haynes says, thank you so much to Chelsea. Royal College of Nursing argument is that decriminalisation is a harm reduction approach and that aligns with the aim of a well-being function for nurses. I'm in health and have argued this point and my nursing management are clear that staff must follow organizational process and position rather than their union's ideological position. And um, I think Linda's put something in the chat line. Did you want to say anything to that, Chelsea? Um, so I don't really un understand how decriminalization has any harm reducing properties apart from that the women are no longer criminalized but under Nordic model the women are no longer criminalized too so I mean I don't think there's any harm reduction um, about it at, at all I mean you can get discounted condoms and um, you know needle exchange but we already had a needle exchange and things like this before um, decrim I really don't think there is any harm reduction about this policy whatsoever. I think it, it increases harm, really. Yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah, hang oh. on a sec. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, I don't know who that was. Was that Anne? It was Anne Hain. Yeah, oh, I was just right. responding oh, to Anne. Chelsea. Oh, yeah. oh that, sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> Please, <laughs> now uh, you've got, we can hear you now, so uh, carry on. <laughs> Uh, I I'm just agree wholeheartedly. Um, whilst I'm not a nurse, I'm, I'm based within health and I went back to nursing management fairly recently because I came across a member of staff who took the position of decriminalisation because that's what their nursing union said. And as I say, was told in no uncertain circumstances, you follow the organisation's position. And thankfully, because we are part of our local gender-based violence partnerships and hold a position um, of uh, Diane's position, and, uh, etc. Um, I was able to be very firm on that in my role as gender-based violence manager. But we do have a complete disconnect between the idea of big organisations like that who have this um, message fed to them that it's a, a kinder way to allow people to have choices in their life rather than accepting we need to stand up to it because it's a harm. So yes, I agree, Chelsea, uh, and thank you for your presentation. Fantastic to hear from you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, Linda, can we come to your question or comment? Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Chelsea. It's really lovely to meet you. 
like Diane earlier, I have followed you previously on Twitter, so it's, I feel a real privilege to actually meet you face to face. Um, one of the things that I found really interesting recently, Chelsea, was there was research that came out which looked at the structure of the sex industry in New Zealand, and it really showed that actually there was links with organised crime. Mm -hmm. And that um, this idea of the legislation allowing women to kind of move up and take control and be all these independent business women with lots of options. Actually, the legislation hasn't allowed for that and that the sex industry is heavily controlled and it's heavily controlled by men. And there's links with organised crime. And what I thought was really interesting was an interview with Catherine Healy from the New Zealand Collective and her retort was, oh, the legislation just hasn't had long enough to embed in. And I think it's very interesting that they she will critique the Nordic model of legislation um, mm -hmm. from Sweden and say it hasn't worked. But there's no allowance for embedding in. And I think it's yeah. the standards. But I thought it was really interesting because it's the first piece of research that I read that clearly articulated how the industry is actually operating under this model of legislation. And it's not what it was claimed that it was going to do. Yeah. So I think, you know, we, this is something I think, would it be useful that we kind of foreground this when we try yeah. to talk about it? I, I think it might also be useful to, um, because New Zealand has, I, I think we're one of the countries with the largest sort of gang membership. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're, but I think we're up there. I don't know what number we are, but we're up there. And um, so the, the gang members, they make most of their money off of selling methamphetamines. And they, they target women in prostitution to buy these because they also buy the women and then, you know, instead of losing money paying to rape women, they're actually making money off the drug sales. So they're, they're, they're earning money off of hurting women and off of selling drugs, which hurt women and the whole community. And um, I don't know, our current government's a bit soft on um, crime. Uh, she, um, Jacinda, I think she funded, um, so the mongrel mob who actually are notorious um, for putting women on the block and gang raping them and stuff like this. And she gave them um, public money to run their their own drug de detox clinics. And I mean, I don't, I don't know what to say about this, but that, so the money confiscated from organized crime is being put back into the hands of these organized crime rings. And it's just, I don't know, it's disgusting, yeah. So gosh, that actually, <laughs> Kelsey. Yeah, is, is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? I can't see any hands up or anything. Um, so, oh yeah, is that a hand? Was that Janet? Yeah, uh, unmute Janet. Can you unmute? Yeah, that's it. So I would like to know how difficult it is for girls coming out of prostitution to get work afterwards, because in this country, one of the things you'd be asked is what you've done before. And I wondered if it's perhaps if it's decriminalized, then it's just counted as another job and, and future employers don't don't count it against you, I don't know. I mean, so and the the effect that decriminalizing it has had, I think, has um destigmatized buyers and, and pimps. Like they're the legitimate businessmen, the the guys running the brothels and all of this. And I I really think that women are very much still stigmatized as, you know, because because that that has to happen in order for them to think it's okay to treat us like this, that we have to be dehumanized. So um it's not likely that you would put on your CV like, oh, I worked at this establishment for 10 years, blah, blah, blah. I was a prostitute. You know, I mean, it's not going to make you look good or hired in a normal um, job setting. Um, maybe if you owned that business, it would. Um, yeah, so um, it's very hard because you have these gaps in time that you can't um, explain where you've been. Um, you also, I mean... That's really what I was getting at, because mm -hmm. once you've left school and you have to account for your time, and uh, if you've been in prostitution, you would have to to say that, wouldn't you? Yeah. So, I mean, the way out is to really start at a very, very bottom minimum wage job and hope you can find some way to work your way up. 
because um really no decent job's gonna gonna take someone without any experience or qualifications and all this time um missing so when when i exited i i worked in a in a factory you know long hours and and then and then i worked doing um hard manual labor i did asbestos removal and and i i moved up from there into an admin position in the office but i wouldn't have been able to go straight from prostitution to um any kind of decent work um i mean i'm still in underpaid work you know um just hoping to be able to move up yeah um could I ask? Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Chelsea, Chelsea said that, you know, women are dehumanized and um, she talked about the way in which the law just um, reduces women. And we've seen that in London with the way the police treat women um, so that all women are diminished, not just women who have been in prostitution, but all of us, every one of us, is diminished by this and that's why the police in London they're getting they get close to the criminals but they also get close to people in prostitution and they get desensitized and okay there's the male thing anyway so we have to criminalize the men and decriminalize the women or we'll never get out of this and Chelsea I'll work as much as I can for this but I, I don't have a lot of power but anyone that has got power will have to work so hard to change the law we're going to change the law in Scotland if we can and you know, if there's anything we can do to, to lobby in, in New Zealand as well and get some kind of publicity mm -hmm. to show that the, the model for Scotland that we're going to have, which is the Nordic model, if we can get it, will work and will help women like you. Um, yeah. And I, I, you know, I do feel dreadful about it, but that's all I'm going to say, but we really need to criminalize the men and to get men to help us. At least there are men here today. You know. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner has said he's horrified by the uh, sexual attitudes of his own police force. Mm. And it's got to be, that isn't the case in most areas. It's only in areas where there is a high level of prostitution that the police behave in this way and have this attitude to women. Perhaps more anyway. Anyway, we best not say any more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Did you want to say anything to that, Chelsea, at all? I mean, just that I, I, I agree. I think that the way women are treated in prostitution, whenever it's normalized or accepted, it, it teaches men that it's acceptable to treat all women this way and that there's nothing wrong with these behaviors. And, you know, these are some really destructive behaviors against women and against society. And, you know, it'll, it'll just proliferates when it's decriminalized. Yeah. Thank you. Have we got anybody else who would like to ask a question? So, or, oh, I saw a hand then, sorry. <laughs> I was straight past it. If you put your hand up, I, I can't see you at the moment. Do you want to? Um, Beatrice had a, her hand up first there, Jackie. Yeah, Jackie, it's Beatrice. Oh, yes. oh yes. hi, Beatrice. Hi. Yeah. hi. hi. Um, Chelsea, I just want to say thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us. Um, I'm, uh, I've learned so much tonight and I'm, I'm sorry you've had the experience you have. And I agree with what others have said as well. It's about changing attitudes. I um, uh, Like uh, Teresa there, I mean, I'd heard about the... Um, the Met uh, report. Uh, I mean, I think it was just horrifying, just how bad it, how bad it is, and it's and it's how we change societal attitudes. But I just wondered, in New Zealand terms, if 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 it continues through the generations, um, how how do how do you stop that? If it's you know if it's got if it's going on year after year after year, and we've got young, particularly young men coming up, um, and it it seems to be acceptable behaviour. Well, I mean, I'm not sure how you stop that. I think that this is, I'm not sure which kind of, sort of a chicken and egg situation, but yeah. you know, New Zealand does have like the highest domestic violence and family violence um, rates in the developed world. And our attitude towards uh, women is, you know, disgusting. And I'm, not, I'm sure that's reinforced by um, decriminalized prostitution or, or we did decriminalize prostitution because we already had these attitudes about what women are for, um, you know, either way. 
um, how you would really change that. You'd have to really change, um, you know, how people view women. And I think first by having the law on our side that no, you know, reinforcing that no, actually we're we're right. We're human. We have a right to not be raped and as part of our work, and and this, and then for that to be really strongly enforced. And I don't think that because New Zealand has already sort of decided and pat themselves on the back that they did something about prostitution when really they didn't. And they sort of left it. I think for New Zealand, it would happen when other countries that we have close ties to, like um, Great Britain and that, have implemented the, the right way. They see that it's working. And then, you know, eventually New Zealand's going to have to say, well, look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Beatrice. Is there anybody else who wants to say anything to or ask anything um, of Chelsea? Jackie, I had my hand up again, oh, yeah. Linda. Chelsea, I think it's really interesting when we talk about this kind of normalisation of this message that sex work is sex work. And I think it's become the standard that people feel you cannot say anything other um and that i think you know just to share something with you but i have real concerns about this but i think we're seeing the impact of this filtering out into the broader understanding of services um you know i've had an i've heard of a member of staff um when a woman disclosed that she was involved in escorting and she was seeking help and this mm -hmm. member of staff said to her don't worry i'm totally fine with sex work i have no judgment of it at all in fact, I pay for sex myself. Wow. So, I mean, I had a similar experience when I went to, um, you know, get counselling and also that um, they didn't tell me they pay for it themselves, but they did sort of try to um, reassure me that, oh, this is fine, this is fine. What I really wanted to look for was someone that I could talk to about the abuse I've been through who, who wouldn't blame me. But so when I'd asked for someone who wasn't going to judge me, that's what I got, someone who thinks it's perfectly fine. And um, I don't think that she realized, um, you know, that, that there was anything wrong in what she said. She was a very kind woman and she was probably doing what she was told is the, the right way to deal with it. So, yeah, it has infiltrated all the services here, that's for sure. And then, as you said, it's the impact it has on you when you're seeking, when a woman is seeking support. Yeah. Somebody's trying to it, seek. It's a barrier them. to yeah. any, yeah, any support. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Chelsea. You're welcome. So I've got Anne Hain with her hand up. Is that left up, Anne, from your previous comment? Or do you want so to it's say? A brand new one. All it's right. A brand Good. new hand, Becky. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I suppose I was just thinking it was just about the previous conversation there. Yeah. You know, if this was truly classed as work, the question that we always get in the violence against women sector about what about the men, you could ask in reverse here, what about the men? Why are men not treating it as a daily business that they can go about, earn their money, have no stigma attached to it, put it on a CV? Um, yeah. Because let's face it, they have orifices that would enable the facility of other men to be able to do what they want. And so the actual ridiculousness of this as a choice for women gets presented when you turn that round and, and put it back to them. They, they would never in a million years want to be treated the way they treat women, that's for sure. And they've just never had to deal with that expectation or that pressure. They've never had the, you know, financial, um, you know, to the extent that women have, women are in a financially worse place, especially if they have children to support or they're you know, all this sort of uh, stuff that gets lumped onto women as our responsibility. So, um, yeah, men have better options. They have no need and they have dignity. They walk around with dignity and it would absolutely shock them to say like, oh, why don't you go sell, sell your anus? Mm -hmm. for this? So that they, they know it's not empowering. They'd never. Exactly. And there lies the, the yeah. you know, the reality of why this is classed as violence and nothing other than that. Yeah. Thanks, Chelsea. It seems to me, um, Chelsea, that with decriminalisation, um, it's a bit like, you know, saying, well, theft, let's decriminalise theft. So then you can't complain if somebody steals anything because it's not a crime anymore. And, you know, that the, there are some very um, real crimes that are continuing, but they don't need to be. Uh, they don't need to be recognised. Yeah. Uh, no. 
So it's almost like a slave trade, but but we're not going to call it a slave trade now. We're going to call it empowering. We're going to call it choice. We're going to um, decriminalize it. It's no longer a crime. If it's so a thump is a thump. But if it's a thump in prostitution, it somehow doesn't count. It doesn't have to be implemented. Mm. It seems to me uh, one of the most cr cruelest ways of treating prostitution. Better off in the Victorian times when almost, you know, it was recognised that um, people were poor and desperate and, uh, you know, had no choices. And then, you know, then to pretend that it's a it's a form of gaslighting how do people feel about having a woman uh prime minister when you've got this uh, huge violence against women mm -hmm. and who um is considered to be a, a good leader yeah it's, it's very disappointing i'm very disappointed in jacinda ardern because you know she she is a our third female um a prime minister and i mean our, our second female prime minister is the one who brought in decriminalization so it's all happening under under women i don't think um she cares much for women at all but she does call herself a feminist um i guess it's just an image yeah well that's a, uh, <laughs> a good note to end on really isn't it you know but um so you you think that um, women would be fighting the cause of women's um, emancipation, and somehow we're 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 going back into the dark ages, really. But, um, has anybody else got anything else they want to add? Um, I'm trying my best to check any hands up. So if you want to speak, do unmute yourself and speak. So. Uh, I think that's probably brought us to the end of this. Um, is there anything you want to finally add, Chelsea? Um, no, just thanks for, you know, listening to what I have to say and, you know, taking it forward where you can. It means a lot. It just leaves me to thank you very much. <laughs> I know you're having a busy week and, you know, we are so, so grateful for you to come here and listen to what, you know, firsthand uh, what decriminalisation is actually like. It's been illuminating for me and you have been an absolutely wonderful guest. Thank you so much. And Thanks. all I can say is I wish you well, so well in your life uh, ahead. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, clap. <laughs> I'll clap for you, everyone. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Love. So, just...